everyone. Welcome. I'm so glad everyone is here on this beautiful morning. My name is Rebecca Pelham. I'm the director here for the Institute for Civic Engagement and Democracy. Um, and I'm so happy that you're here at this panel. It's co-hosted by Social Sciences, the MALS Department, and Learning Resources, as well as ICED. And we have with, you, uh, with us um, several really wonderful panelists, and our moderator, Professor Tapia, will be introducing them momentarily. Um, just to let you know why we're here this morning, we want to talk about advocacy. We want to talk about the reasons why we get involved in our community, how we make decisions together to make our community stronger, how we come to consensus on our direction of where we want to go as a city, as a county, beyond. Um, so a couple tools to help you do that in advocacy. One, if you're able to vote, definitely register. And we have uh, voter registration available today. We'll pass the forms around. Um, if you are able to register, please go ahead and take one or if you want to give it to a friend. Um, and if you want to turn it into myself at the end of this um, panel, you're welcome to do so. Or you can drop it off at the ISID office or even mail it in yourself, whatever works for you. And in addition, there's also an opportunity to sign the rights restoration petition. Has anyone heard of that today? Rights restoration? Okay. Beautiful, we get to share this with you. So the Rights Restoration Campaign um, is a petition campaign so that in 2018, um, on our ballot, we will be able to vote whether or, we not, we, whether or not we want formerly incarcerated felons who are nonviolent, non-sexual offenders to be able to have the right to vote. Florida is among three states in the nation that does not restore the right to vote um, after a felony conviction. Um, states like my home state of Vermont do not have laws like that. So it's a choice that we're making as a community. Um, and I encourage you, if that's something that you support, you have an opportunity to sign a rights restoration petition today. And we have with us Lavelle, who is in the back there. And he will be able to get you um, signed up on that petition. So without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator, Professor Tapia, who will introduce our panelists. So thank you so much. Good afternoon, and I'll, my name is Professor Tappy. I'm a professor of political science and international relations here at Miami-Dade College, and I will be your moderator for today. I want to introduce the panelists and thank them for being here today at Miami-Dade College. Our first panelist, I'm going to start from my, my right to left, and I'll, intro, I'll, I'll allow each of the panelists to say some brief words, but I, I want to just introduce who they are, Leah Weston is the policy director for city commissioner, Miami city commissioner, Ken Russell, and that's district two, which represents the areas of Coconut Grove, Brickell, parts of the roads going all the way up to even northern parts of the city of Miami, the Upper East Side and so forth. And she'll say a few words. Also Matthew Sarkarski, who is a faculty member here at Miami Dade College in our English and communications department. We also have Matthew, I get from the city of Opalaka. He is a commissioner with the city of Opalaka, recently elected, correct? And so we're going to have the panelists introduce themselves with some brief, brief words. We'll start from right to left. Is this on? Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Leo Weston. Uh, as, as the professor said, I am the policy director for city commissioner Ken Russell, uh, city commission for the city of Miami, which is the largest city in Miami-Dade County. Uh, contains some of the areas of the city you might be most familiar with, like downtown and Brickell. Um, a lot of, it's kind of the, the center of the financial engine of our city. And so we deal with a lot of very interesting issues on the waterfront, uh, environmental issues, lots of things like just everyday issues, streets and sidewalks. Uh, I'm an attorney and my job is to research legislation and policy and to advise my boss on how to vote on issues as well as to help write laws. So. Um, I've practiced law before, and now I'm in a position to where I get to write them, which is, is just pretty fun. And, uh, hi, I'm Matt Sigorski. Uh, I teach English here at the college. Uh, before teaching here uh, full-time, um, I did do a little bit of political work. I worked for the uh, 2012 um, Organizing for America, which was the grassroots wing of President Obama's uh, presidential campaign. I worked in Coconut Grove. Um, and in my classes, I try to uh, incorporate some of this uh, advocacy work um, into some of our assignments, into some of our units. Um, my 1101 students will be writing a uh, issue 
focused advocacy letter. Uh, we also study kind of the history of Miami to maybe understand kind of where our government structure comes from and how it's had an impact in the past. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Good morning, can you hear me? My name is Matthew Pygan. I'm the city commissioner of the city of Obalaka, a small city a little north of here, 16,000 residents, 4.5 square miles. And about, let's see, it's 2017 now. So about 13 years ago, I probably was in your shoes as a psychology and African-American studies major, had no clue about government, didn't care about government. Um, and I found myself involved in politics because of, I was, disappointed what was going on in my city. So I stepped up and ran for office. And now I'm one of five people that make decisions, over 16,000 residents, 4.5 square miles, and $36 million budget to ensure that I make, that the community live, eat good, and safety. So that's the power of local government um, that we have. And everybody can get engaged and get involved. So I'm looking forward to this conversation with this esteemed okay. panelists so we can get the party started. Thank you. And in fact, your, your remarks lead right into our first question on what inspires you, what inspires different people to basically make a difference? And what do they love most, or what do you love most about what you do? So we'll start off with the commissioner, because you opened up already the conversation talking about what inspired you to run for office. And if you could share how you went from being a student that may have been apathetic towards the issues in the community to making that decision to run for office. And then once the commissioner finishes, we'll go over, we'll go from left to right to keep it fair. All right, well, what inspired me was actually, um, I, there was a few things that, that happened in the city of Opelika. I used to work as an intern there. Um, I was in real estate development as a consultant. Um, and I interned in the community development and planning department so I can get a better understanding about how real estate works. Um, while I was there, I had a great relationship um, and with the city manager, and I heard that right after I left that he was gonna be fired. Um, so I went out there to speak on his behalf, and I was extremely disappointed with the way I was treated um, as a resident um, by the dais. I went to three commission meetings before then and was escorted out by police twice um, by being a very respectful um, and just asking questions that I guess people didn't want to be asked. Um, then over the course of the next few months and years, I heard uh, quite a, some horror stories going on in the city of Opelika. Um, basically a commissioner committed suicide, uh, people being indicted by the FBI, the FBI raiding the city. Um, there was a lot of things going on, and I just did not like that for my community. This is my home. This is where I lived at. So I decided to, to be the change that I wish to see in the world. And I stepped up, and I ran for office because um, the people needed it. When with city government, there's usually a very small amount of people that control, um, make the decisions on behalf of thousands of people. Here in Miami-Dade County, which we're under, it's 13 people. Um, that control that make decisions on behalf of over 1.2 to about over a million people of a budget of what over two billion six billion six, in Miami Dade County six billion dollars over 1 million people and 13 people make those decisions think about that so if you really want to create change and craft a community because it, this affects all of us they determine how much money goes into uh, resources like Miami-Dade College. They determine how, where, where um, businesses are gonna be located, what residential places need, need to be picked up, where trash is gonna be picked up. So if I wanted to live in a better community, I needed to be a part of that decision-making process. So that's why I stepped up, um, trying to be short. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Professor? Uh, well, what got me to be a bit more active was, uh, I'll never forget, I was. It was right after I had gotten done with college and I was sitting here down in Miami um, and I was watching the Democratic National Convention um, in about 2012 uh, and I didn't have anything to do. And Michelle Obama said, we need you, right? So uh, I decided to uh, go volunteer the next day after I had been kicking it around for a little bit of while, a little while. 
Uh, the next day, I walked to the local office uh, and I said, I will volunteer. And from there, I started learning about all the issues regarding uh, voter registration, uh, about voter education, about the importance of voter turnout and community organizing. Um, and so from there, we had a hugely successful uh, office and you know, obviously we know the outcome of the election. Uh, so that's what got me kind of more interested in actually doing something um, in terms of um, engaging people um, and being engaged in the community actively. Uh, as a teacher, um, I've always wanted to uh, share you know, some of that experience or some of that information uh, with my students. Uh, the importance of you know, just writing a letter, of, of being aware of you know, how local government works, how national government works, how state government works, uh, these types of processes, uh, some of the history behind it. Um, this is very empowering information, right? Um, if you don't know, you know, for example, you know, how a law gets passed or who to contact about an uh, issue in your community, or you maybe uh, just need that little push to take that first step to, um, to get involved, to contact people in your community, um, one thing I love about teaching is a uh, great platform um, for being able to do that and being able to empower other people to do that as well. Thank you. So I think um, like many people who get involved in advocacy or activism, I had a moment where I woke up. Um, and this was in 2005. I was a college student like you and I was living in New Orleans. I, I was attending Tulane. And in 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit. Um, and I just, I, I evacuated, of course, I'm from Miami. I know what a hurricane is like. So I didn't, I didn't waste any time leaving the city, but I did watch on television as the city got engulfed in water and I realized who was left behind um, and that they had very different skin color than me. And it, it just, it, it woke me up to inequity in our country um, in a way that I, I really didn't understand before. Even though I went to public school and Miami's a very diverse city, I didn't understand exactly what inequality meant until I saw people standing on the roofs in Hurricane Katrina. And, um, and that, that was the moment I woke up and I decided I need to get involved in, in some way and make the world a little better. And I don't know that there's a neat path that I followed. You know, I, I was in college and I started getting much more involved in my local community. Um, I met a group of people who were really interested in all kinds of issues uh, related to the environment, related to safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. And at some point, I realized that it's actually incredibly easy to make change at the local level because like the commissioner was saying, you know, it's a very small group of people who controls decision making here. And a lot of people think that everything is corrupt and that everything is inevitable, you know, inevitably fixed. But the, the truth is that it's just the same people who are present for the decision making. So if more people get involved and new people get involved, those, the outcomes can change. And so um, I got very involved in being an activist and, and getting involved in the local government. And at some point when, when I was about 26, I had graduated college, I was just working, I decided I needed to go to law school um, because I felt that that was the best way to, to really learn how to advocate and make change. And so I went to law school and then I, I practiced law. I represented veterans before the federal government, fighting the government a lot uh, before I then went into the government to try and make it better. So that's, that's kind of my story. Thank you. Talking about different current issues that you've worked on and are working on right now, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the current issues that you're working to address in our communities? And I'm gonna start with, with Leah, because you, you started off talking a little bit about advocating for veterans, whether it was at the federal level, but at the state and local level, what are the issues that you're currently working at on now in, let's say, City of Miami and District 2, whether it's the budget or it's working in a beginning of transition as you guys are now having elections this coming week for a new mayor. So what are the types of issues that your community is addressing? I think the two most important issues in the city of Miami are number one, sea level rise, climate change. Um, that's a huge threat to our infrastructure, to the way that people live, to a lot of the property that people own in our district uh, because my district uh, includes all of the waterfront of the city of Miami along uh, downtown, Brickell, it's where all the big buildings are. It's, we have a lot of flooding issues in Coconut Grove. So sea level rise is, is number one and other number one is affordable housing. Um, we have a crisis in Miami. People cannot afford to live here. And the real estate is just getting more and more expensive. The wages have not kept up with the cost of living here. 
and the state of Florida has um, prevented cities from setting their own minimum wage. So we as a city are trying to figure out how do we make the housing more affordable for the people who want to work and live here. Professor? Uh, well, currently, um, I'm mostly just uh, you know, working here teaching English, but in my classes, uh, I am making sure, um, in particular in my 1102 class, that we are going to start looking at uh, not just um, problems, right, but uh, taking an approach of how do we solve these problems, right, which can be very empowering um, if you are uh, you know, sitting there just saying, well, here's a problem, and here's a problem, and here's a problem, right, it can be very um, disheartening, right? Uh, but if you actually start maybe focusing on, you know, what can we do to solve that problem, right? If climate change is a problem that is important to you, what are some steps we can take to solve it? Um, so I'm trying to uh, get students maybe engaged in focusing on um, solving problems, addressing problems, as opposed to just um, identifying what those problems are. Thank you. Before we continue, I wanted to introduce and thank Rebecca Garcia from the University of Miami and Student Power Alliance. She was delayed in, in coming, but she's present now, and I wanted her to introduce herself, just say some brief words of who you are, and the question that we're answering at the moment is what are the issues that you're working on currently in the community that you feel is important? Hello, hello everyone. My name is Rebecca Garcia. I am an alumni of the University of Miami. I majored in international studies with a minor in Latin. Um, I'm sorry for <laughs> being late. Um, I do not know how to navigate this campus, obviously. Um, so yeah, I started out as an activist my sophomore year of college. I've been involved in a slew of different activist activities, ranging from labor to immigration. Right now, I, uh, I am staff for the Second Chances Campaign, the petition to restore the right to vote to 1.5 million incarcerated, um, formerly incarcerated persons in Florida, returning citizens to society. And I, we are working right now on the voter restoration effort. And it's an issue that's very near and dear to my heart because I am always an advocate for civil rights in uh, each and every aspect. And that's what we're working on right now. In addition to that, I am um, also an immigration activist as a daughter of Colombian immigrants. And that's what we're working on, so yeah. Thank you. Commissioner? Thank you. Um, I have a few issues that I'm working on, but most of them are mundane. Um, our roles, we have some infrastructure projects that we have to take care of in the city of Opelika, some water building issues um, that we're taking care of. This is my first year in office, so that's what I'm working on as a city. But my most important thing that, um, that I am determined to make happen is to increase civic engagement. Um, that is my biggest issue. Uh, making sure we get more people involved. Um, as they say, more, the more people, more new people that get involved, the more the outcomes will change. And that is what we need to do. People have this fear of government and become apathetic about government because it seems so far away and it's these people that look a certain way, talk a certain way. But it's like that because it's basically the same people that run for office, that be in office year after year. When I say same people, it may be the exact same person or friends and relatives. Um, and if we want to change our communities, we need different people to get engaged and be involved um, and bring those different perspectives to the table. So what I've been doing um, since I've been in office, what I call Pygate on the Block, where I would literally go to corner stores, to parks, um, to apartment complex and sit out with the community to teach them about um, government, invite them to the commission meetings, go through the agenda with them, hear their concerns and help them to identify what they need to do to address those issues. Um, and that's a process that we need to continue to have and that you can get engaged in um, as students here um, at Miami-Dade College. Commissioner, are you reading my notes? Because the next question is exactly that. <laughs> what strategies, and I'm gonna, since you started it off, we're just gonna continue it that way. It's flowing, I'm telling you. What are some strategies you have used or you have witnessed? And what are important lessons that you could share in regards to civic engagement and advocacy that has worked? So what effective strategies did you use to be able to overcome, let's say the establishment voter, overcome some of these dynasties that you've, you've referred to here that we see in different communities in different cities in order to get certain issues across and to get them passed and advocated for? Um, as a community organizer, um, one of the things I learned that in order to 
engage a person and get somebody to open up anything, you got to show them that you care. Um, to develop a person or anything, you have to love the people. Um, and that is one of the most important things. People come from a wide variety of different backgrounds. We see it within our families. We see it in schools. Uh, people are people. People are human, no matter where they come from. And if you want to create change, you have to pull upon who their basic human instincts of caring and love for their families and their communities to bring them up together around certain issues. Um, for example, uh, is that Rebecca? Yeah, Rebecca's working on um, getting um, ex-felons the right to vote, returning citizens the right to vote. There are quite a few people um, that have had instances or run-ins with the law and to be able to tell them, no, you cannot vote anymore. <laughs> you cannot participate in your community or make any decisions in your community just because you've done something bad. We've all done things um, in the past. So to be able to identify and help people to understand why these things care, why, why does it impact you, and then pull upon that caring to get them organized around something. That To me, that's the basis of community organizing. That's the basis of, of governmental change. Um, so that's why I said with Pygon on the Block, going out there, engaging the community, identifying their concerns, and helping them to meet one another and build together. Um, that's what's most important. That's what I, I, I do. Thank you, Commissioner Rebecca. So my absolute favorite professor in college, my penultimate semester in college, I took a class on Black Lives Matter and breaking New Jim Crow, which really motivated me to work for the voter restoration effort right now because we are essentially breaking the New Jim Crow establishment in this country. Um, he always said the squeaky, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? You cannot remain complacent. Um, that has been my number one motivation in community organizing. Uh, organizing at University of Miami was difficult. Being a woman of color um, in a predominantly white, you know, um, campus, you know, University of Miami is 60% white. Obviously, my mentality is not going to match that of a very privileged, you know, person who identifies as Caucasian. Um, so uh, I had to always be on my grind, right? Um, and this is not not to sound harsh, but you can't remain complacent because things are going to try to break you down. Um, and always, just always never to remain complacent. Um, even when it gets tough, because organizing is tough, activism is difficult, um, you have to always have that number one motivation, right? Um, also, what has definitely helped me, um, connecting to my roots, um, embracing my bilingual nature, my bicultural nature as a second generation immigrant of Colombian, you know, um, daughter of Colombian immigrants who grew up in this country I have to navigate a couple of different worlds in my life. Um, but it has always helped me to kind of bridge, you know, um, between like, you know, my Latino heritage and then my American heritage. And it's definitely helped me to um, reach communities I didn't even realize I was capable of reaching. I worked on the Hillary campaign last year as an intern. And I think that the, one, the number one tool that really helped me was my bilingual, my bilingualism, speaking in Spanish, making campaign calls in Spanish, because it really shows your community that you're still connected, that you're not alienated from them. Um, what the commissioner was saying, you know, you have to show that you care also. Um, and then finally, um, forming coalitions is so significant. Um, we worked on a union campaign um, in the University of Miami my, so my sophomore year of college when the food service workers on campus were trying to unionize with SCIU and uh, the way our student group helped to get, eventually get those union rights um, after a very long two-year campaign was through forming coalitions with different student groups um, because all issues are intersectional. Everything is connected. Nothing exists in isolation. Absolutely nothing exists in isolation. So we have to recognize that we all are fundamentally connected no matter what the, no matter the, what the cause that we're fighting for, and we have to form coalitions to show that we all stand in solidarity with one another. Thank you. Professor? Yeah. I would have to say it's also important to recognize that um, little things do matter, right? Um, like going out to get yourself registered to vote and then maybe going to get a couple of your friends registered to vote, right? Um, little things do in fact add up to quite a bit. Um, I remember you know, my first day volunteering for the Obama campaign in 2012. Um, I maybe registered one or two people to vote, right? Uh, the next day it took me about an hour to find another person to register to vote, right? Um, but over the course of several weeks, right, um, 
I must have registered at least 50 people. And the volunteers I ended up training also went out and registered uh, several people. So little things do add up and make a huge difference, right? Whether it's getting registered to vote, whether it is um, getting your parents registered, right? Uh, your friends registered. Um, and also educating yourself, you know, about the community. How is local government structured? You know, Miami has a crazy government structure, right? It's much different than other places, right? Um, we have a county that oversees several small cities, right? Um, plus we have the state government. It can be very daunting to kind of get a handle on that, but there's very little steps we can take uh, to start learning about that, educating ourselves, right? Um, you know, writing a letter to a politician does not seem like a big deal, right? But if you and maybe 10 other people do that, or you or 30 other people do that, right? Or maybe you write to several different politicians. These things can start to add up uh, and they can start to make a big difference, right? So um, we often hear you know, about huge projects, um, things going on, but I think an important thing to remember as well is um, you know, even a small thing like going to a volunteer for a campaign once a week after work, right? Um, these things can really start to add up and make a huge difference in the community, right? Um, so if you, you know, you're busy, you have school, you have work, these types of things, oh, that's very understandable, right? A lot of us have that as well, right? But little tiny things, um, want, and once you take that first step, um, once you send that first letter, right? Once you go maybe vote for that first time, right? Once you maybe get a clipboard in your hand and start registering voters, these types of things, um, you will keep doing that, right? It is definitely um, infectious. But I have to, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, doing little things like that matter, right? Even if it's just educating yourself about something and talking to your friends and family about it, right? Um, that can have a snowball effect. It can make a really big difference. Thank you. Leah? And, and just to that point really quick, um, when you write letters to local officials, people read them. I read them. Um, maybe my boss doesn't personally read everything, but somebody on his staff like myself does. And when it comes to voting on an issue or taking a position, that can really change the outcome if you hear from enough people. So I, I want to put a plug in for, for writing a letter or sending an email or making a phone call because that can actually change an outcome as well. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that the essence of building power is, is building relationships. Um, I'll tell the story of my boss and how he got elected because it's, it's quite inspiring actually. Um, it, was, it was an insane election. There were nine candidates for this local commission race. And there were two top contenders. There was the wife of the outgoing city commissioner. Uh, so, you know, they shared a last name and they, they, were, they had an advantage of raising money. And then there was uh, someone else who was kind of the, the candidate who was against the previous commissioner but, was, but had, a lot more, um, had, a lot, had a lot more media presence and had a lot more money and, and was kind of the front runner. And while the top two were busy fighting each other, my boss was busy knocking on doors and meeting people and meeting his neighbors and meeting the people that he knew would go to the polls. And because of that, um, he was able to make it into a runoff and he beat out the top two candidates. And that was simply because he took the time to knock on a thousand doors and say, hi, my name is Ken Russell. I'm running for city commissioner. You know, tell me what you think about the city of Miami. What are your issues? And he, in learning what other people were concerned about, he became an advocate for them and managed to get elected. So that's all to say that it's, it's not impossible to take on family dynasties. It's not impossible to take on people who are able to raise a lot more money. It's just about building relationships. Just a quick plug. Your commissioner made such an impression that the other candidate even dropped out of the race in the runoff election, right? That's, 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 yes, that, that was, goes that, to that was show great. the power of advocacy. I, I wanted to, to basically highlight an issue that you spoke about when you talk about civic engagement, because there's some websites such as ncoc.org that would rank Miami last out of 50 major US metropolitan areas in terms of civic engagements, right? Civic engagement. Twin Cities in Minnesota, where I spent some time going to school, ranked at the very top, and they did have a lot of civic engagement in Minnesota and in the Twin Cities. What do you wanna see from young people to basically have them get involved And in? How do we turn that around to have young people advocate, get involved in campaigns? What are the different forms of advocacy that they could get involved in? And how do you ignite a very powerful local let's say citizenry here in Miami-Dade County, or at least in, Miami, in the city of Miami? Well, I think you have to start by, you know, what 
what is my hypothesis on why that is, right? Um, and I have, I have a, well, first of all, I think Miami is a young city. It's been highly transient. There are not a lot of people who are from here. Maybe in this room, there are some folks. Actually, how many people were born and raised here? Okay. Well, me too, actually. So, but that's really unusual. Whenever you, whenever I meet somebody and they ask me, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Miami. You know, it's like I'm a unicorn. Um, and I think that's starting to change because I think a lot of people are choosing to stay here or it's just the generations are shifting. And, and part of that is when you have a highly transient population, there's no incentive to get involved. Um, some people only live here for a few months out of the year. They're snowbirds, you know, they go back to New York or whatever. And then I actually think that the beautiful weather here um, deters people from getting involved because it just, it makes you feel like everything is great. I mean, Twin Cities, though, the weather's horrible. I, don't, I wouldn't want to live in Not that in freezing summer. cold. I mean, in the <laughs> summer, it's beautiful, but that's like three months out of the year. Um, and so I think, I think it's really easy to get distracted in Miami. There's lots to do. It's a, it's a beautiful city. But I think the young people that are coming up in, in our political environment right now are better than that. I think, I think actually young people are really engaged. And I, 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 I almost dispute th this measure of civic engagement at this point. I think people are engaging differently, whether it's, you know, sharing through social media or I, I also think that um, the traditional government meeting and the way it's set up is, is kind of antiquated. Um, I think that governments need to start to rethink how they involve citizens. Um, I think it's crazy that it's easier to order a pizza than it is to vote. And I, and I hope that your generation will change that. Professor? Yeah, I don't know why people aren't as involved here. Um, I agree with some of the, uh, the reasons just given. Um, I would have to say maybe another thing, as was mentioned here as well, is it, it seems perhaps sometimes that there are some obstacles to getting involved, right? Like um, registering to vote up until recently, you had to actually send this form in by snail mail or you know find somebody uh, to register you on the streets, right? Um, and also in, in sometimes perhaps the, the problems uh, that, that maybe we're facing can seem you know, so overwhelming that it's, you know, well, what do I do about it, right? Um, but again, I think, I think we go back to you know, just taking a first step, right? Um, I brought um, Engage Miami to uh, a couple of my classrooms uh, to speak, I think, last semester. Um, you know, maybe attending a meeting, right? Going and getting involved with some groups. Grab one of your friends and you know, go to uh, find an organization and get involved. The ISET office is a fantastic resource for that. Um, if you're interested in getting involved with anything, uh, go to the ISED office. Uh, they are located, um, was it 4206, right? 4206? Uh, 4204? I, 4204. I think they changed because of construction, oh, right. though, but right. I think they're uh, back in 4204. But if you're interested in getting involved, if you're interested in voting rights, if you're interested in uh, registering voters, right, something like that, they have lists of organizations that will have events, that will have meetings, right? I mean, again, you don't have to be, you know, the president of the organization, right? If you go and you attend a meeting, right, uh, maybe you go to an event, right? Um, you are somebody there. You are somebody, you know, making a statement, making a difference, um, these types of things. So it's, it can be real difficult to take that first step, right? And so I guess maybe that's what I could encourage you all to do is to take that first step, right? Um, you know, if you feel like you want to get involved, just go do it, right? Um, and that will have a difference, make a difference. Rebecca? As a student, I was a, I just graduated in May, so it's not that long that I've that I've been in like the working world. So I I'm definitely coming at this from a student perspective because in my mind I kind of still am a student. Not still, um, you know, life is tough, and when you're a student, you have student debt, you have family obligations, you have to graduate, you have to do a thousand different things, you have to do an internship, right? It's so difficult when you're a student. At least it was difficult for me when I was a student at UM because it's not just going to class, it's thinking about all the other thousand things that go on while you're still in class, you know? So, in, you know, you guys are probably dealing with a thousand different issues right now. Um, and so maybe activism might be like the last thing on your mind, right? I think that the solution to that is definitely um, provide like incentivize students more. What that incentive is, I have no idea yet. Uh -huh. But um, for example, um, if there's like some, you know, if students have like entrepreneurial skills that you can incentivize, you know, people to do um, like a good cause or some way, you know, maybe it might be money, it might be college credit, things of that sort. I think we need to just come up with more innovative ways on how to incentivize students more because it's difficult for, you know, even I admit it, you know, when I was working on the Hillary campaign, you know, putting in those long hours 
but you know, I was essentially a volunteer intern. You know, um, it was difficult putting in those long hours, and you know, maybe I might, you know, let's say you make a hundred calls and you might hit five people, but the next minute you need to like do homework. You know, it's just the reality of the situation. We need to incentivize students more and come up with more innov innovative ways on how to provide that incentive, you know, because the work is so important. It's so important and we need you. But it's, we do need to incentivize. We do realize that, you know, your lives are difficult. You have bills to pay. You have, you know, mouths to feed. And we need to just come up with a more innovative way on how to incentivize you more and how to get you more into the movement, but then without draining your energy, your time, your money, and your resources. Commissioner? I think there's three reasons why um, a lot of more people don't get engaged and involved. Um, number one is basically human nature. We're selfish. We want to know what is in it for us. Two, uh, we don't understand our power. And I say that because when we look at government, we look at the opportunity for us to get involved, we have the power to create the change in our community. There are plenty of people across uh, Miami-Dade County, across the nation that have started movement and gotten involved to do specific things like, for example, feed the homeless, making sure the homeless are, are taken care of, restoring voters' rights, to being involved and engaged in a community where you can literally craft a community to suit for your children. One of the reasons why I got engaged and involved, I'm in Opelika. I bought my house in Opelika. That is my home. I'm going to raise my kids there. And I want to make sure they're proud of the environment that they live in. And too many of us don't realize the power that we have as individuals to create the change in our community. This world, this community is the way it is because of people. This room that we're in right now is designed by our architect. It was thought of by the board of Miami Dade College. There's only a few people on that board. This panel was organized by the professors, by a few people that said, you know what, this is what I want to do. And now we're creating this environment where each and every one of us are able to share our stories and be able to engage each other on, on ideas. Now, there are quite a few ways in which students can get involved. Do what you love to do. Do what you care about. Whatever you want to do, do it. If you like um, anime, start an anime club. Get engaged, get people organized to do that. You may create a new anime for some, for, for, for people. If you like sewing, if you like painting, create a club, do something, and start to teach people in the community how to paint. You, we, we don't realize, and then, and not only does that, does, will that expand the opportunities for you to learn more about anime, you to get more involved in painting, you to start a motorcycle club and all that, but it also something that goes on your resume. It is amazing and impressive when you say, I started an organization um, for, for painting classes and we expanded from one to 50 students in, a, in one year. And we raised about uh, $3,000 and we created um, painting classes for the local community to teach uh, students how to paint. That is impressive. That is something that would get you noted, that may get you awards, um, and that may lead to a job opportunity. So everything that you do, if you, st if you start with what you love to do and just expand upon it to see, okay, how can I do this for my larger community? And you have to keep the community in mind. Each and every one of you are here because of a community of people. Your parents invested in you. They put a roof over your head. They fed you. You had teachers that took time out of their lives to teach you something. People that cared for you, that built these institutions, built these roads to make you be able to live in this community and work and move and do what you want to do. So you owe it to that community to shine, to be who you want to be and give back your unique stamp on this world. And all it takes for you is to step up and do it. Write your papers on the issues you care about. Start those organizations. Work in places that you care about. And make money doing it. You can do make money, be awesome, and give back to your community. Commissioner, real quick, I want to follow up because I think you've hit on some issues that is going to go into our last question. And then we're going to open it up for the audience to be able to ask some questions of their own. But what are some of the issues that you would be advocating for if you were a student today in today's world? And then why should students today care about local governance? And what happens when they don't get involved 
in advocating for the, the issues they care about? What happens when it comes to decision making on those particular issues? So what issues would you be advocating for today if you were once again a student in the classroom? I'm gonna start with the, the last one. If you're not at the table, somebody deciding upon your life. If you're not at the table, you're part of the meal. So if you want to be eaten, if you want your life control, you can step back and I'll make the decisions for you. And the people that are elected in the office will make the decisions for you. And if you don't care about what we make, that's on you. But you are completely removing yourself from the decision making process, which means your family, your sisters, your brothers, your kids have no, no influence on what's going on. And all you, got, all you can do is just sit back and be quiet and smile at me and wave and say, okay, whatever you want, I can do. And if you don't want that, then you get engaged yourself. You step up. You make sure you vote for the people that you care about. You advocate. You work on their campaigns. Um, and you build bases of power. As um, um, someone said earlier that the essence of building power is on relationships. That is the most truest statement that you can possibly find. The people in this room, literally, if everyone in this room got together um, to work on just one candidate's campaign, they can literally make sure that person gets in office. I, we transformed Opelaka and got, I got elected by, by, shoot, less than a fifth of the people in this room. So don't, don't, don't forget your power. Do not forget your power. You have the power to create the change. All you got to do is step up. Step up and get engaged. And then you get things like your resume gets built up. You get recommendation letters. You may get scholarship opportunities. You may get internship opportunities. And things that build you as a person. Did I answer all the questions? Yes, you did. Okay. Rebecca? So, like I said, I just graduated, right? Um, and I honestly thought that I was going to become a union organizer, that I was going to, um, that I was going to go into labor, and then I got hired by the Second Chances campaign, and it's changed my life fundamentally. I work right now to restore voting rights for 1.5 million returning citizens in Florida. Florida is one of four states in the country that permanently disenfranchises you if you have a prior felony conviction. Um, and also Florida has the largest percentage of formerly incarcerated persons as part of their state population. That is insane. Let's say you get, you know, let's say you get busted with, I don't know, whatever, an, an illegal substance, you know? Um, a, cop, a cop stops you, you can get sent to jail, you can get sent to jail for like 25, 30 years, you know? And then when you get out, you still cannot vote, you still cannot engage in your democracy after you've repaid your debts to society. You know, I work, all the time to restore, to help restore these voting rights. Right now, um, my partner, Laval Strong, is passing out petitions. If you are registered to vote and are over 18, please sign them um, because we need you. We need your signatures. You know, that has been my, my cause since August. Um, and so right now we're over the halfway mark in terms of, petition, of petitions collected and signatures collected, and we have a month left. You know, um, if you want to talk to me afterwards on how you can get involved in really transforming Florida's democracy for years to come, please talk to me. Um, uh, so that is a cause that is near and fundamental, that is so dear and funda near and dear to my heart. But then the other side is immigration. Um, when I was in college, um, immigration, unfortunately, UM was not like a place to discuss immigration rights, but you know, with the repeal of DACA, um, and as a daughter of immigrants, you know, I have to advocate for my community and um, immigrants are some of the hardest working people in this world and they deserve so much better. So um, if I were still a student, <laughs> that would be the, a cause that I would probably work on campus, but I, I'm not a student anymore, so. <laughs> Thank you. We have about four minutes left, so I'm gonna go to the professor. All right, I'll be very brief then. <laughs> Uh, one issue that, you know, especially if you're planning on transferring is you might want to uh, think about or I would be involved in if I was a student, still the cost of education, right? Um, I am sitting here with a ton of student loan debt. I will admit that, right? I don't know if that will ever be paid off. Um, not only that, though, is this student loan debt is a huge impediment to uh, not just your individual economic development, if you uh, are economic progress, but also our nation as a whole. I mean, if you figure how many people in the middle class, right, um, are sitting there instead of 
uh, putting their money back into the economy, right, are sending a check off to Sally Mae for four, five, six hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is a big issue, and it's something that can be addressed, right? We're sitting in a, uh, co a community college building right now. Um, it was not too long ago that that was just an idea, right? We're going to provide low-cost education to anybody who wants it, right? Well, here we are, right? And now the idea is we should make this free for all, right? Uh, so maybe we can make that happen, right? Uh, so that's just one issue I thought maybe I would be involved. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Leah? Um, I, don't, I don't think I could tell you what to care about because I'm not a student anymore and I, I'm not sitting in your seats, but I will say that I think one thing that you all should think about is, you know, when you're, next time you're watching the news and watching a hearing from Congress or, you know, watching some reporting on, on the government, take a look at who's, who's in power, who's sitting there. Do they look like you? Are they close to your age? Um, do they represent your views? I, I think there are a lot of people making decisions about your future who are not going to be alive for your future. And I hope that you'll think about that because you have to determine what you care about. Uh, I can't tell you what to care about. There are lots of great causes. There's rights restoration, there's immigration, there's student debt. I mean, there's a ton of things to care about. Um, there's tons of things to be mad about. But I think systemically, you, you need to study like who is making these choices and, and do they represent you. So you would be advocating for campaign finance reform? Is that what you're saying? The question is, what would, what would you? Me, personally? Yeah, um, if I were sitting in, in your seats, yeah, I think, I think I'd say student debt. I, student think, debt. I think that's, um, debt is, is an albatross. It's something that hangs around your neck. I have a lot of friends who are deep in debt from law school and from, from undergraduate. And the, the greater debt that you have, the fewer choices you have in what you can do. Um, I'm very fortunate. I, I got a scholarship to law school. I don't have any debt, which means that I can take a job that doesn't pay as much that I care about. Um, and, and that's, that's given me a lot of freedom and I, I feel so bad that so many people that I love and that I care about do not have that same freedom and I think that's, that's going to be the biggest issue that's going to hurt, um, hurt the younger generations. Thank you. We have enough time for one question. If anybody has a question that wants to approach one of the microphones, do we even have microphones there? No. Anybody? All right. Well, it's going to be about 10.50. Please join me in thanking the panelists for coming out. And please, advocate and get involved. All right. It's exactly 10.50. Thank you for coming. Can I just say to my students, if you have your homework, you can bring it up here and I will take that, please.